And it's just doing it and doing it over. That's what builds confidence is doing it and feeling good about it and feeling successful. And once you do that, then you can do more. you ever have so many questions and no one to ask so they're just wasting away on google searches you'll forget about in an hour or so we had that same problem and that's why we created the rd to be podcast a resource for dietetic and nutrition students looking for answers that their peers don't have we are students macy and emily and registered dietitian carl barnes we engage in conversations and learn from rds join us weekly as we gain insight into the unique journeys of registered dietitians all over the country Welcome back to another week of the RD to B podcast. I'm your registered dietitian host, Carl Barnes. This is our weekly podcast where we sit down with a different awesome registered dietitian each week to really showcase the diversity of opportunity in the field and also dismantle the notion that there is a traditional career path um, by highlighting all of these awesome accomplishments of registered dietitians. Speaking of which, we're sitting with Neva Cochran today, um, a very accomplished dietitian who wears many hats. Um, thank you so much for being here. Excited to, to learn more about and, and hear from you. Thanks, Carl. And thanks, Emily, for asking me to do this. I'm really excited to be here. Um, just a little bit about myself. Um, I am Neva Cochran. I am a nutrition communications consultant in Dallas, Texas. And I work with a variety of food, nutrition, and agricultural organizations to promote accurate information about nutrition so that people can eat beyond the headlines and enjoy their food, not fear it. And uh, over, I do that in a variety of ways, which I think we'll talk about today. But I have also been very active over my entire career as a volunteer and a leader within the academy at all different levels, um, local, state, and national. Great. Well, thank you so much for taking time out to speak with us today. So I know you've had many past roles that you've kind of mentioned. So what experience do you think has really impacted you the most over your career? You know, I, um, after I, I worked in two different hospitals starting out and I did my master's between the two of them. And, um, then I went back after I worked at the second hospital and I was an instructor in a dietetics program at Texas Women's University where I'd done my master's. Then I went to work for our local dairy council. And that's when I really figured out, you know, what my niche was. You know, it was kind of like I knew that hospitals weren't really doing it for me and even teaching students how to be dietitians and supervising them in their hospital setting. You know, it just wasn't Filling, fulfilling me. And so once I got to the Dairy Council, we were doing nutrition education for teachers, we were doing community outreach, we were doing media and marketing and public relations, I really figured out, oh my gosh, this is what I love. And at the very same time that I started that job, I started being a state media spokesperson for the Texas Academy. And so I did that for five years. And and then I, um, you know, was able to kind of, it was synergistic working at dairy and doing the state media rep. And then I was selected after I did that for five years as the national spokesperson for the academy media spokesperson. And in doing that, I, you know, was able to um, get a lot of professional training in media. I got a lot of contacts. I got a lot of experience. And so it helped me to actually create the, the consulting business that I have today in nutrition communications. Great. So as you know, obviously you talked about uh, quite a few roles that you had. So with those roles, what do you think are some traits are that really make it crucial and vital to fulfill those positions? This is no big surprise, I'm sure. It's in the title of my position. Hands down, it's communication. Mm -hmm. You know, whether you're doing one-on-one -on -one counseling, you're managing employees, you're presenting to groups, or you're working with the media, communication is absolutely the key to being successful. And it's, it's not just talking. You need to know your audience. You know, when we're doing media, we always like, what's the audience? Is it, is it children? Is it women? Is it, you know, older people? You, know, you have to craft your messages to your audience. And then when you're, you're in a group, either one-on-one -on -one with a patient or an employee, or you're, you know, in a group where you actually can have, you know, back and forth, you need to stop and listen, listen to the questions, listen to the comments that they're making. 
And you need to ask them questions so that you are having a conversation. You know, we know so much. We know so much information and so much about the science of food and nutrition, but we have to be able to have a conversation and not be like a lecturer or a parent to these people, because that way they're much more likely to listen to and ultimately put into play some of the recommendations that we're making. So it's really, you know, having conversations with people. That's great. So I guess there are always some benefits like learning how to communicate well. So what are some challenges specifically that you've, you know, encountered, whether it's, you know, in your current role now or as a media spokesperson in the profession? Yeah, I think as a, as a spokesperson, and this is translated from, you know, being actually doing the, when I started out, we were doing magazines, newspaper, radio, and television, but I was able to successfully segue around like 20, 2009, 10, when I saw my clients going over like to more internet-based media, like social media and blogging, I really transitioned effectively. So it's like, I see these in both places, but one of the things that I think is most challenging is so many people come with preconceived ideas about food and nutrition that are, they're very emotional about, and they're very attached to. When you start saying things that are in conflict with this, it's almost like they, they don't want to believe it and they want to like challenge you, whether it's a reporter or whether it's like online, someone puts a comment on a blog or puts a comment on a social media post. So again, your communication skills are really important here that you don't start a fight, that you start a conversation. Um, and you know, one of the things that I think that I find most rewarding about working with the media is that you have a huge stage. You are able to reach so many people. Like I worked for 20 years for uh, Woman's World Weekly, a weekly magazine. And for eight years, I had a column that was in that magazine every single week. And I found out that they did focus groups and they found that that was the number one read page in the magazine and the wow. magazine was the number one selling magazine off newsstands not didn't count subscriptions because they didn't really do subscriptions but just picking up at the checkout at the grocery store look at all those people i was reaching with good mm -hmm. information i mean i couldn't do that just me being a dietitian here in dallas texas and so the same thing when you're on tv or you're in a magazine or in a newspaper or on the internet you are reaching just a really big audience yeah, you never really know how many people yes. you're reaching. So I know you precepted over 120 <laughs> interns. That's not even talking about the people that you touched through the column in the in the um, magazine that you were writing in. But what are key pieces of information that you would tell interns? And then I guess what's key advice you would include in those columns? Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking about like as an intern, giving you some advice, like during your internship, how you should do. And, and I mean, I know this from experience from precepting interns. Um, I think first and foremost, ask questions of your preceptor and act like you're interested in the rotation, no matter if it's like the last thing you ever think you want to do. In fact, my husband, who is a physician, told me that when he was a medical student, he was going through different services. He would always tell the attending physician, this is the area I want to go into. You know, even if it wasn't true, but it makes, it gives you like a one up, like, oh my gosh, they're interested in what I do. And, uh, you know, so uh, there's nothing worse than, than having a precept or have an intern. And I, I precept them for a week or they, they rotate with me for a week not to ask a single question. And I've had a few interns that do that. It's just like, you feel like they're just checking off boxes. What do I do next? What do I do next? What do I do next? Um, so I, I actually told one of them in our evaluation, I said, even if you have no questions to ask, you can't think of a single question to ask you need to come up with some questions to ask. Like, you know, why did you decide to become an oncology dietitian? Like, what's the most challenging part of your job? What's the most rewarding part of your job? I mean, literally, like ask a question because, you know, I, I'm giving of my time and I love doing it. But if someone doesn't seem to, to care, it's like, why am I doing this if you don't care? Okay, second, I you have to find your passion. Now you obviously know that my passion is, is nutrition education, community nutrition, 
um, communications and media. Now that may not be your passion and that's fine. If your passion is being a nutrition support dietitian and some of my close friends are th do those and they are so passionate and they are so good at it, but just find your passion and you may not find it immediately and that's okay because I didn't. I had three jobs before I found what I really wanted to do. So, um, you know, there's an old adage that says, if you love your job, you never have to work a day in your life. And that's how you want to feel. And then the other thing is, you know, you don't have to keep doing it. If you don't like it, you can find something else. When I was in my job at the university, I had a, a, an older lady that was about to retire, a professor that, that I shared an office with. And she, we were talking about another faculty member. And she goes, you know, Neva, you can have 30 years of experience or you can have one day of experience repeated 30 times. So think about that one year of experience repeated 30 times. You're doing the same thing over and over and over. Um, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to have something that every day was fun and different and new. And then finally, this is a real sticking point with me, stick with science. You know, there is so much information out there, especially with the internet and with social media that, uh, that people encounter about food and nutrition that's totally wrong. We all know that. But unfortunately, there are even some RDs that I see that are really like repeating stuff that they see in headlines that is not accurate. It doesn't actually represent a study. Or, and so we need to be, we need as a profession and as an organization to be conscious that we are sticking with the science. So even if you read an article, even in a health website that is quoting a study, you need to go back to that study and make sure they're quoting it right. Because I've done blogs about how studies have been misrepresented in the media and the headlines, especially sometimes even the headline doesn't represent what the article says, but the article is really not representing what the study says. So be really careful about, you know, framing your advice to patients or customers or clients based on what you read in the popular media that's quoting a study because it may not be correct. You know, was that study done on animals? Um, how many subjects did they have? Um, you know, was it done on, on really, I just had an article about green tea extract and I pointed out that the study was done on mice and they use green tea extract, which is much larger quantities than you get by drinking tea. So you cannot apply these results to humans. And they actually put all that in there. I was so excited because, you know, people, the headline will say green tea cures GI disease, <laughs> I think it was fatty liver disease. It said that the green tea cured. But anyway, you have to be super careful about that. So those are my three bits of advice, you know, like to mm -hmm. stick with science, find your passion. And when you're an intern, be interested and in ask questions. Most definitely. So I guess going a little bit about uh, going back to the science aspect. So as, as an undergrad, I don't know if other people um, run into this situation, but we don't really run, read through literature that much. So how would you advise students to properly, you know, understand it comprehend it and you know relay it in an art like in a correct and articulate way um i would you know just read the study and there are actually some checklists that um one is the international food information council which is foodinsight.org they have a checklist that you can look through with a study it's a hierarchy of looking at you know um you know what kind of study is it because the studies are are graded based on, is it a, a, a case control study? Mm -hmm. Is it an observational study? Is it one where you have um, randomized control trial with a control group and a subject group? So you need to look at all of that. Um, um, and like I said, again, you know, look, is it animals or humans? What is the intervention? Um, it's hard on, on, on a podcast to really explain all the things that you need to do. But I would say, you know, first and foremost, you need to go back to the original study. And if you don't really, you know, if it's difficult for you to understand that I would go to someone else who is an expert in that area of practice and say, how do you interpret that? Now, another thing that you might do is say, you know, you'll see things like, um, red meat causes cancer, new study says, you know, I've seen headlines like that. Well, okay. Um, I might go to the national cattlemen's beef association because you, generally if it's, if it's a, a maligning a single food, they are the first people that are going to look at that study. They're going to get an expert to like interpret and evaluate it. And it's one source of information as to, you know, 
you know, I'm not saying that, that you should use that as your only source, but it's one way of looking at what are, you know, the limitations. And another thing that I do is, you know, always at the end of a study, they'll have like, what are the limitations of the study in mm -hmm. the researchers own words, you know, read those and see, because sometimes they'll say, well, we don't really know if you can apply this because there was like such a small sample size and it was only done in women. And so, you know, they will even sometimes admit, you know, these can't really be applied in, in general. So I don't know if that helps, but those are just a few Definitely. that I would look for. Um, and I know that it's not always easy. Um, and now students at a university usually have full access to journals, but I know a lot of dietitians do not work. Now I'm fortunate that I do have access to a medical library, but one of the things that you can do, you can always find the, the abstract on, on PubMed. And then usually they will have, even on that, they will have like the primary author uh, and wh or whoever's the corresponding author is. And it usually will have their email address. Email the author and ask them, can you send me a copy of the study? And a lot of times they will do that. And, and there's nothing wrong. Or, you know, if it doesn't, you can, I can find anything. Um, look up um, the name of the, the primary author Mm -hmm. You know, because it'll tell what their university is. And if you go to that university website, almost all of the faculty members have an email address on the website. And you can just click on that and send them an email and said, I saw your study on, you know, cancer and vitamin C, you know, can you send me a copy of that? That's great. So I guess going back a little bit to, you know, how you were like on national TV and like writing in, um, you know, well-accredited articles and magazines. So how did you form those connections? to become, you know, able to do that? You know, it's interesting because I never set out to be a media dietitian, but I realized when I look back, I was doing it on my very first job. I lived in a university town where my first job, I was the only clinical dietitian in a new hospital, first and only clinical dietitian. And uh, I subscribed to the local paper. Like I said, it's a university town. There were two universities there, Denton, Texas. And I um, they had articles about crazy things about nutrition. And so I started writing letters to the editor. I mean, I wrote the first one because I was just incensed that they were big feature story about this family and all these crazy things they were doing. And I said, these people, this is not accurate. And you're portraying them. I was just upset. And I didn't ever think it would be published. I just wanted to vent. And so I literally typed it out on my typewriter and, and mailed it in. That's what we did back then. They published it. They published it in the letters to the editor in the paper. Oh, wow. And so then I, they had another one. So I wrote another letter and they published that one. And then they finally had a nice article, an accurate article about school lunch. And so I wrote, I said, well, I should write them a nice, art, uh, nice letter. And I did that. Well, guess what? They started calling me for quotes, for articles they were doing about nutrition. And then we started a dietetic uh, a district um, in that in that city. And so I was on the a founding member and I was the community nutrition chair. So I said, why don't we have a column in the paper? I will ask them. And so we had asked the dietitian. So we would have this column like of questions and answers uh, about nutrition. And it just all kind of went from there. I, I uh, so then what happened was I, I ended up going back to Dallas and I was active in our district and I had an opportunity to go on a children's TV show for nutrition month oh. for one interview. And I, uh, I was so excited because I'd watched this, this show as a child and I went on and I told them that. And so they kind of wove that into the interview. And after it was over, they said, that was so good. Will you come back every week during nutrition month and do a different food group? I did, the, I went back five times. So right after that, the state media rep position, they started the program and they needed to choose somebody from Texas. So everyone's going, you have to apply. You've been on TV because dietitians weren't on TV back then very much. Mm -hmm. And so with my, you know, my little portfolio, <laughs> I applied and I was, I, that's how I got into the being a state media rep. And then it's just all kind of come from that. Um, and I actually told this story. It's a 10 minute and it's on my, um, my YouTube and you can link to it from my website. But I did a commencement speech for the College of Health Sciences at Texas Women's University in 2016. And I tell this story in a little more about how I went from, you know, my first job becoming a media dietitian. 
That's great. So if you, if you want to hear more details, you can go and listen to that. Of course. So obviously you're not shy at all <laughs> you're going into these, you know, crazy platforms and stuff like that. So for students who are not confident with public speaking or presenting information, or even they're just unsure about their nutrition knowledge, what advice would you have for them for, to become more confident? Um, you know, I have something that this was the name of that, that commencement speech. And it's actually advice that I have given when people say, do you have one piece of advice that you would give me as a student, as an intern, as a young dietitian? And I don't know where it came from, but somehow several years ago, I came up with it and it's take opportunities, make opportunities and walk through fear. And when I look back, that's, that's kind of what I did in my career. And believe it or not, it may seem like I'm really outgoing and never lacking for words, I was not like this. I was really the shyest, quietest, most reserved, afraid young dietitian there ever was. Wow. But on my first job, I told you I was the only clinical dietitian and the first clinical dietitian. And I was in a private hospital where they wanted me to get out in the community. They want me to have students come over there. I mean, this was like, I reported directly to the administrator. So- mm -hmm. Um, one of the things is like, she's here, use her. So every patient group, like, you know, the respiratory therapist said, come talk to my, my breathe easy club, the chronic lung patients, come speak to the heart group, come speak to the group with diabetes. And then I started getting in the community. People were wanting me to come and speak to this group and that group. And then the university started wanting me to come and talk to the students. I mean, unbelievably, I mean, and I was still scared. I was scared and nervous and I probably wasn't as, as good as I am now, but what it is, it's like riding a bicycle. You know, when you get on a bike the first time you, you fall down, but you keep doing it and you keep doing it same way. Like when you learn to swim, um, cause I remember learning all these things and they weren't easy, but once I did it, I was off and running and it's just doing it and doing it over. That's what builds confidence is doing it and feeling good about it and feeling successful. And once you do that, then you can do more. And I think also, you know, the key is always being prepared. All we, don't go into something, we, we are trained in media, never go into something unprepared. We always have our three key messages. We have techniques for getting the messages in. And this works in everything. It works like in media, but it also works when I'm doing public speaking and ans answering questions. You know, being prepared and knowing your information is going to make you more confident and more um, relatable to your audience. So I think it's just like take opportunities, make opportunities and walk through fear. Just do it. Definitely. Great. Um, and then would you mind just talking a little bit about what you do currently in your day-to-day -day job? I do um, internet, like what I do, I have, I do blogs. I have my own blog, but if you go on my website, you'll see, I have a lot of blogs that I've done for other people. So that's one of the services that I do for organizations or companies. And right now I have four kind of on, well, three ongoing clients, um, Bayer U.S. Crop Science, which I think I'm in my seventh year with them. They're an agricultural company that, that works with, you know, they sell products to farmers. So anything farmers need to, to grow their crops, then they do that. And then I work for the Leafy Greens Marketing Agreement, which is a sanitation safety program for leafy green farmers in California. And I work with them. I did like content for their website. I have written blogs for them. Um, I oversee a group of dietitians that's our, our lettuce advisory panel. So mm -hmm. I do, do things like that for them. And then the California Cantaloupe Board, I also like created information like for their website, like the nutrition content and the health content. Um, I created an event for them uh, where I had a culinary dietitian doing recipes for cantaloupe and we did it for, for in, dietitian influence that, that do a lot of like social media and blogging and stuff, hoping that they will take this information and put it out, you know, on their platforms as well. Um, I do a lot of public speaking, um, like next Friday, a week from today, I am speaking to the North Carolina Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics on leadership. The next week, I'm doing a pr my, my signature presentation, Eating Beyond the Headlines, Sorting Evidence from Emotion. I am doing that for a group of Animal Agriculture Alliance allies, and it's farmers and veterinarians. So I'm kind of talking about some of the, the animal agriculture myths and what are the nutrition uh, uh the nutrition content of these foods 
And then um, communication, how do you communicate effectively when you're getting bombarded with negativity about these, these foods? Um, and then I am presenting at the Texas Academy, my agricultural presentation, Nutrition Starts at the Farm, Healthy Meals from the Ground Up. Um, anyway, so I guess that's kind of like, it's all communication related. I'm also on the Speakers Bureau for National Cattlemen's Beef Association, and they're actually sponsoring me for the presentation that I'm doing in um, uh, North Carolina. Now for bear crop science, I do things like I've done farmland film screening, which is a wonderful documentary about six young American farmers. Uh, kind of follows them through their work. And I have a panel of experts after that we, we have this. And I've done, we did some virtual ones during COVID, but they're usually in person. A lot of them at universities or for dietitian groups. Um, I do farm tours with them. I've done farm tours for college students, like busload, go around to two different farms and have speakers. So I do events for them. Um, and I, I can do events for other clients as well. So I hope that kind of in a nutshell tells you the kinds of things that I do. And I've had a variety of clients over the years. I mean, if you go to my website, you can see I've worked with animal ag clients. I've worked with like California Raisin Board, Cherry Marketing Institute. I've worked with soy. I've worked with corn refiners. I've mm -hmm. uh, worked with dairy. I've worked with eggs. Great. Well, yeah, that's a mouthful. You do <laughs> so much. I don't know how you have you know, time to do this. Um, that's crazy. But um, yeah, so I guess my last question will be that for people who are unsure of what niche they want to fall into, um, what kind of general guidance do you have for them figuring it out? I, I, like I said before, I didn't really find my niche until my fourth job. So I think one of the things that I recommend is don't be afraid to leave and pursue something different if that first position doesn't make you happy or fulfilled. Um, one of the things that I'm thinking that you might want to do is if you are a student, you might contact dietitians and either talk to them on the phone or through Zoom, or if you have the opportunity to actually go in person to like shadow them for a day, I think that can help open up your eyes to different areas of the field. And I have people do that. I have people call me and just ask for my advice or ask me what I do. I mean, literally I've had people out of the blue come and say, I wanna work for you and I'll work for you for free this summer, you know, and, and, you know, sometimes I can do it. Sometimes I can't, or I'll just let them come and spend a day with me. And I've actually had um, someone that was finishing up their internship and he found me on LinkedIn and he was calling all, he was contacting all these dietitians on LinkedIn and said, would you have an hour or like 30 minute phone call with me? He just wanted to find out about all the different, you know, things that people were doing. And I think that's a great way to kind of maybe narrow down what your interest might be. Uh, and as I said, during your internship, take the opportunity with all the dietitians who are your preceptors to ask them questions, to find out more about what they do, what they like, what they don't like about their specialty, what they find rewarding. Um, and then I think one of the things that I have found most rewarding in my career is being involved with the uh, academy in different leadership positions. And I started, like I said, in my very first job when I was in Denton, Texas, and we formed the local district association. And I was, um, I was um, uh, in a leader and on the board of that organization. And I don't, my career would not be anywhere like it is today, if it hadn't been for leadership, not just from the media, but from all the other things I did, like being on the foundation board, being in the house of delegates, because I have this huge network of people. And one of the things that I'm known as um, in, in dietitian circles, I mean, not just in, in Texas, but other places is that I'm the connector. You know, if someone wants to find somebody, then, you know, I, I say, oh, I know that person and I'll do a connection email, you know, between the two of them to introduce them, you know, I really go into like, here's what this person does this. I don't just say, oh, here's this person's email, just contact them. You know, I try to like set the stage and, and help them really introduce them like we're almost in person. And, uh, you know, I've had a lot of success in, you know, helping people to like find jobs or make connections or get information. So uh, I, I never be afraid to call and talk to someone no matter how important you think they might be, because I'm, I'm really willing to, to help anybody that asks me. Of course. And I feel like that's something especially important in our profession because people are so willing to help and wanting to help. It's just us students having to seek it out, find you guys and talk. 
Yeah. And I think that, you know, the one, his name was Omar. He, he just went on LinkedIn and he just started looking for these people and, oh, this sounds like interesting. And then connected with me and then sent me a message. That's great. Well, LinkedIn you. is one of my favorites. It was my oh, first okay. social media platform. I mean, I can find out if, if I find a new person, I'm like on there, like, who is this person? What are they doing? Definitely. LinkedIn is a lifesaver. Great. Well, thank you so much for taking time out to speak with us today. Oh, you are so welcome. It's been so much fun and good luck to you on your internship match and to everybody else out there who might be doing the same thing right now. Thank you.